Okay. Yep. Okay. Great. Is everyone okay? Yep. Good. All right. So we'll. I'll just keep an eye out for Bettina to come back in, um, and feel free to you know wave me down or or uh, if I'm not paying attention and she's waiting or something, uh, feel free to 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 notify me. Um, okay. I'm gonna. Um, let's see here. All right, attendees, can can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, okay, great. All right, um, well, thanks everyone. Um, we were dealing with a little uh, technical challenge, but, um, but we are gonna get started and I think we'll be able to solve the issue. Um, Thank you everyone for, for coming. Uh, before I get started, uh, we're going to um, we're going to inaugurate this this meeting with uh, some music from our guests, uh, uh, John and Jamaica, um, and they're they're going to uh, get us started, and then um, and then I'll, I'll I'll begin my introduction. Um, so thank you. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, we want to dedicate this to all of the panelists, to Patina and Kaika, um, Giselle and Dan um, and Mario. It's so good to be here with you and, and to be um, at this place together. This is a song that a friend of mine and I wrote for two young men who disappeared on Kaho'olawe Island, which was being used by the US military for target practice. They disappeared in 1977, George Hellman, Kimo Mitchell. This is a song that memorializes them. Oh, 
thank you. Thank you, John and Jamaica. Uh, I couldn't find, I couldn't think of a better way to get us started by referencing the sea as something that connects us and that holds our memories and our loved ones and, uh, and that charts us a uh, path forward through that. Um, so first things first, um, we're able to provide translation um, in Spanish and English for this event. So if you prefer to listen to all their speakers in their, uh, by their own tongues, uh, then don't make any changes. Um, but if you want an English translation, find the Zoom menu uh, bar at the bottom of your window and, and click on the globe icon and select English. Uh, y por español, uh, busca la barra de menu Zoom en la parte inferior de su ventana y haga clic en el icono del globo, globito luego selección español. Y tiene problemas, uh, if you have problems, uh, escribe en el chat and uh, ask us in the chat for help. Uh, so welcome everyone to the Frontline Report, Indigenous Resistance to Mega, mega Projects in Mexico and Hawaii. Uh, my name is Jason Chang. I am Associate Professor of History and Asian American Studies at the University of Connecticut where I serve as the director of the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute. And I also want to thank UConn's El Instituto and the Native American Cultural Programs for their support uh, for this evening's, this afternoon's uh, event. This is really special for me. Mexico and Hawaii have really, uh, have been uh, such a part of my life and to have an event that really connects these two places um, and thinks through them uh, is very special to me. I'm, I'm very proud to, to be a part of this. Um, even more so, uh, AAASI, the Institute, is proud to be working with Ben Barson, who is our 2020-2021 uh, artist in residence. And as a member of the Afro Yaqui Music Collective, we're excited uh, to have this possibility of working with this group of artists, activists, and their wider network of scholars, performers, freedom fighters and community builders. So th this program was made possible by the help of AAASI staff, Courtney Sack and our incredible translation team made up of Nicole Aris Araceli Gonzalez via Texas, Gloria Marie Pena Alicia, a doctoral student at UConn and Kenny Tran, a member of the I Am Not A Virus campaign via Seattle, Washington. This team has been so important because we acknowledge the challenge of speaking across borders. Uh, and so they help translate between our colonial languages. Um, we are listening with curiosity and humility and we grow our appreciation for, uh, for their indigenous languages. And mistakes and gaps are, are expected and we approach these as opportunities to learn and to inquire deeper. As a transdisciplinary racial justice institute, we are charged with creating a learning environment informed by the struggles of our time. Indigenous resistance to mega projects is a defining characteristic of the 21st century and demands a perspective from the people on the ground. The model of this event as a report from the front lines emphasizes three key principles. First, knowledge derived from struggle is essential for growth. Two, we learn more by finding out what matters in the dialogue between struggles. And finally, third, that we recognize art and performance as vital ways that indigenous culture defines the strategies, values, and rationale of their fight. So we as the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute have an obligation to shed light on the dispossession and deprivation of the US empire, but also that of Asian imperialisms as well. Large scale industrial commercial and science projects continue to advance upon indigenous space threatening more than sovereign rights and autonomy. This frontline report brings news from Yaqui and Mayan communities along with the Kanaka Maoli struggle to preserve Mauna Kea 
and alter the island's structural energy dependence. Projects such as Tren Maya and Isthmus Industrial Corridor are, are in violation of the Mexican Constitution's guarantee of indigenous land rights. In Hawaii, the 30 meter telescope project desecrates native Hawaiian sovereignty over their ancestral land. These projects threaten thousands of unique species and do not serve these indigenous communities. I'm gonna share a map so you can see, uh, see Hawaii. So here's this one. Um, the United States, along with Asian capital and local power brokers have pushed for these projects in both Hawaii and Mexico. Both ma major protests to these projects have been an ongoing fact of life for years. And now state violence in Hawaii and political disappearances and assassinations in Mexico are becoming alarmingly frequent. While these struggles are held in common, they're also materially interlinked as trans isthmus pipelines of Mexico transport Caribbean fuel to Pacific tankers, which feed Hawaiian tourism, sustaining a settler economy. Yet these con connections are not the first time either. In the 1870s, Mexican officials who had waged war on Yaqui independence turned to a modernist astronomy adventure sailing to Asia and stopping in Hawaii to participate in the global project to measure the transit of Venus. So more than a hundred years later, we're here together. Uh, we're here to learn together and to fight together. So the, we'll, we'll first hear from the frontline reporters followed by our frontline performers. And then we will finish with uh, dialogue and questions. Uh, so first we're gonna hear from Mario Luna Romero, a tribal secretary of the Yaqui Hold on, let me pull up a map here. Of the Yaqui tribe of Vicam, Sonora. He was a notable spokesperson of the Yaqui's, Yaqui people's resistance to the independence aqueduct planned in their territory in Sonora. Through 2012 and 2013, the Yaqui of Sonora have blocked major roads. He continues as an important activist and is now mobilizing mutual aid during COVID-19 while continuing his work as a water defender. Next will be Lucila Bettina Cruz Velasquez is a Mexican human rights defender and member of the Asamblea de los Pueblos Indígenas del Istmo de Tehuantepec in defense of the territory, the, the land and territory um, in the Santa Maria Shandi municipality of the Te Tehuantepec Isthmus in Oaxaca. She is also a member of the movement of civil resistance against high electricity prices and has faced significant threats against her because of her human rights work on land rights and the rights of indigenous peoples. Next will be uh, Ikaika Husi, founder of Hawaii Federated Industries, former editor of Ka Kawaii Ola, founder of the Hawaii Independent, the Summit Magazine, and Maoli World. In addition, he works as an organizer for Unite Here Local 5. And I wanted to share this image too of connections long long-standing connections between Mexico and Hawaii. And finally, John K. Kamakawiwole Osorio, a Kanaka Maoli musician, activist, historian, and dean of the Hawaii Inuiake School of Hawaiian Knowledge. And their frontline reports will be followed by the performances from Giselle Seneth, Rodriguez, singer, cellist, urban farmer, and activist at the intersection of indigenous rights, eco-socialism, and migrant justice. She'll be accompanied by Ben Barson, our artist in residence, and ASCAP award-winning composer and protege of the late baritone saxophist and, com and composer, Fred Ho. Their music will be followed 
by the spoken word performance of Dr. Jamaica Heoli Meli Ka Alani Osario, a Kanaka Meoli Wahine, artist, activist, scholar, and assistant professor of indigenous and native Hawaiian politics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And with that, I want to invite Mario to begin your, your frontline report. I ask that you speak slowly and uh, clearly into the microphone and, um, and we'll have uh, 15 minutes uh, for each person uh, to hear from. And thank you all for, for being here and, uh, and very much looking forward to the conversation. I'd like to thank you for inviting us. Very excited to be able to share with, uh, with my companions, Matina, but also Ben and Giselle. I'd like to break all the uh, barriers that have been imposed between us and our, and our friends in Hawaii and uh, form this network of communication. The Yaki tribe has been one of the tribes that's given the most resistance against, against the, the uh, reclamation of territory, appropriation of territory. It's very important not to lose this territory. When it's uh, questioned whether we are a tribe, an ethnicity, or, or a race, we answer we are a tribe. But after so many fights and, and wars, our tribe has not been able to be eradicated from this land. They've tried many times in attempts of colonization in Mexico. But nonetheless, they've not managed. Thanks to the bond that we feel with the land. The aspirations of the Yaqui tribe have always been peace, to be able to grow as a nation, as a country, within our territories. We don't aspire to invade other nations. The Yaqui tribe has been trying to grow with what they already have. Completing a divine mandate to care for and treasure this territory and this part of the universe that was conceded to us. And that is how we define territory. And in order to understand the Yaqui territory, we must explore the elements which comprise it, including us, the Yaqui. And therefore, the Yaqui who inhabit this territory is nothing more and nothing less than an element of this territory, like the flora, the fauna, the water, the river. And we all cohabitate in this world, this Yaqui world, which we have fought to preserve. We've paid a large blood toll. In the past few years, speaking of colonialized Mexico, our, our ancestors, our Yaqui brothers, have been faced with many wars for their in independence. They've also participated in the Mexican Revolution, and all of them have consciously participated with our goals in mind. What we ask always, every time that we participate, has been peace. 
that we have our autonomous reign over ourselves to decide our destiny as a as a tribe as a nation it's been a constant fight a big undertaking that our ancestors have left to us and so we would like to participate with you understanding that so much as in Oaxaca as it is in Hawaii we're trying to conserve that autonomy that right that inalienable right that the human race has to decide their destiny for us as a Yaqui tribe and Yaqui nation that's been something that's natural to exercise that right Nonetheless, the powers that desire our territory, that want our water, are trying to eliminate this way of looking at life. And they've committed criminal acts against us. They've tried in 1910, for example, to exterminate us. Before the Mexican Revolution, more than 10,000 men, women, and children were stolen, sold as slaves. From Sonora to Yucatan, to Campeche, to Oaxaca. And this, so many, since even though all that time has passed, there hasn't been any healing from it, a loss of trust, their inability to cooperate with the government has been erratic, it's worrisome, because they represent the country. The, the country has say in it. The government doesn't have any say in what we are doing. So we're going to continue to fight and question these projects that seem advantageous, but have another meaning behind them. We must remain alert and attentive. And this is something that we've been learning as children so that we can maintain defense of our territories not to abuse of our territory, but to conserve it and live there and be able to pass on that inheritance to our children and those who get to be born, to protect what our ancestors, our grandparents have left us. So in the past several years, the fight for the water has been intense, intensely stacked against us. But it remains something of great importance to us. We inhabit the state of Sonora, which is a semi-desert region, very little vegetation, very little water, and the only river that is, runs through it is the Yaqui River. And that's the river that sustains life. So to us, it's very important, besides the fact that it produces agriculture and food, behind the, the need for to, to hydrate our animals, it's a this is something that helps us connect with what's invisible, with our faith. And that's how we view the river and the water. And when the government in 1910 said that they wanted to intervene with the water and the river so that they could transfer it to the cities, they didn't consult with us. So we began a very intense legal battle and in the streets because we, because we know the government. We won all those tribunals. 
estaban dispuestos a obedecer sus propias leyes. Por eso we es, knew that they were not disposed to obey their own laws. And that's why we actioned this judicial fight with resistance in the street as well. And we've had to fight those of us who know who are initiated. Que cumpla sus propios mandatos que sus propios jueces han dictaminado. Y en esa not lucha, to trust the government. They, they've Introducción de drogas antes desconocidas. Por they've, nuestros... they've presented drugs to our cities, to our nation, uh, jailed us, criminalized our defenders, invaded our privacy and our private lives. Una campaña we mediática. found a campaign of hate towards our nation. And all of this. according to the government because of the crime of wanting to live in peace in a territory and to protect the river and the water. And for the time being, the defense that we've presented, we've presented in Mexico, Sonora. Since we know that they don't want to obey their own laws, it amplified the pressure towards our nations. We've aligned with the, uh, with the aid from Washington in order to protect these laws and prevent the violation of our rights. And through all of this, we've found We've not found the necessary support, but we have found solidarity with other tribes who also fight against these projects. The Yaqui territory is in a very strategic position, and it's a few kilometers from the United States borders. It also coincides with the sea. And when there, where there is no richness in agriculture, there, there is a, a richness in mineral. So there, there. So there are mines, and therefore, uh, there are depo mineral deposits to make our land even more desirable. And to them, this river is just another form of merchandise. And in this version, we try to fight against the appropriation of these elements and of these resources. And in, it's, a, it's a crime. It's a, we've paid a very high price for what we've defended and for what our ancestors defended without any rest. Little, little, little by little, what we've been able to preserve from one generation to another, we've tried to preserve this without any sort of exploitation, rather to provide a future in a stable place Propia, that's antes. permitted us to maintain our ancestral language, a history that continues to grow, to maintain the idea of a communal source of life and maintain our unifying symbols. To know that it's not only the body which is nourished, not only materials, but the spiritual side that maintains us united throughout through the Yaki River. That's that was my presentation. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Mario.
Wow, well, Mario, uh, muchísimas gracias. Y me gustaría share este mapa una otra vez para la, la audiencia. Aquí podemos ver el, 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 el río Yaqui. Here we can see the Yaqui River. En las montañas de Arizona. Begins in the mountains of Arizona in the United States. And it nourishes our land because we have desert region. And we start capturing the water in three dams. For them, it's an important mine. And the governments administer. And yet we maintain the rights to that water. But we don't truly have them. They've been denied to us despite having been the original inheritors of this water. And so they are reorienting, reorienting the water to these industrial cities, industrialized cities. Great. Um, thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Um, y, I'm going to share a couple of uh, minutes of this video if he has uh, time left for his. Um, so this is from a movie, uh, yes. uh, Mover on Rio, um, which is a really great documentary. We're just going to show a minute of it or so. Oh, um, excuse me, I need to share my audio. I, one more, just one second. I made this mistake in the past. So let me not make it again. I'm just going to show one more small clip from the same film um, that I think touches on some of the uh, philosophical elements that Mario was sharing. La mamá es la que se encarga de, de decirle a los chamacos, ustedes que saben hablar, Dios les dio habla para que ustedes defiendan la tierra, el agua, el mar, el monte. Y los cerros, así les dicen. Yo soy Olga Alejandra Espinosa Mapomia. 
Y mi profesión es curar con medicina natural. Uso el, el monte como medicina. Si no hay agua, no, no nacen las medicinas. Para hacer test te sirve el agua, para limpiar las, las ramas, las, los raíces, para todo lo utilizas. Y el que sabe va, va a absorber, va a entender el viento, lo sabes. Ahí sí se comunican los antepasados. Todo el tiempo, nunca estamos solos. Por los mayores antepasados siempre nos dijeron eso. Siempre nos decían que los blancos o los que tienen dinero iban a tratar de robar el agua. Las tierras, los cerros, el mar. Y eso es lo que estamos viendo. Porque en todas partes, el que tiene dinero estanca los aguas, los, los, según los guarda. Pero no era así. Porque guardando el, el agua, ha de cuenta cortarte una vena. ¿Cómo va a vivir una persona si le cortas la vena? Pues el mundo es igual. Lo estamos matando. O digo, el que tiene dinero lo está matando. Tiene que correr el río, los ríos, los canales, todo eso, tener agua, pero no, no hacer canales con, con pavimentado así, con cemento, sino que corran en el, en el suelo, en el subsuelo, en los ríos, que tengan vida, que tengan agua, para que empiece la vida del mundo. And I think that's all the time we have right now to share that film but um if you want to get in touch with mario or us just uh leave a note in the chat and uh, jason will hand it back to you thank you ben it's such a powerful narrative about without water there is no medicine um and you just told us how important healing is from these these traumas and um, and I and I just appreciate the, this you being so um, so open to sharing your story and uh, now I want to turn to uh, to Bettina. It's tu turno. Bettina, it's your turn now. Bettina thinks her audio is disconnected. Um, thank you for your patience as we resolve these technical difficulties. Um, okay, maybe I uh, try again. This, the Zoom struggle is hard. I just want to thank our whole team for putting so much time into setting up all the technological requirements, Courtney and Jason and Kenny and Nicole. They've really worked really hard to set this up. And uh, we're still troubleshooting what the technology can and, and, and has more trouble doing. Um, All right. Maybe that like she's 
tried to reconnect to audio. Mm -hmm. Ahí va, ahí va. Ah. Ánimo, ánimo. That was Giselle, not Bettina. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I think John and Jamaica should sing another song. Yeah. <laughs> Ahora. No, no, no. I'm sorry. But actually, you know, I'd like to propose that John speak before me. Oh, He's sure. He's a real historian. <laughs> and I'm um, just an activist. I can fill in the gaps. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe while we work on um, Bettina's yeah audio we can have you go john okay we can do that okay, yeah. um, oh, oh one moment uh, sorry john yeah uh bettina thank you for trying again thank you for uh for this trying to make this work i'm sorry for the difficulty bettina podemos oírte sí yeah bueno podemos escuchar Buenas tardes, noches a todas y todos. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Bettina Cruz Velasquez. I'm from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and I would like to speak a little bit about the projects that have been imposed on the region. And in this day, very threatened by this new government, by this uh, Maya train railway. The following the following screen. You showed a screen earlier that showed Tehuantepec, uh, leading to many different parts of the world. Well, the part of the isthmus of Tehuantepec, located in the thickest part of the, the country, that's uh, the isthmus, that is where I live. And that's where per currently a uh, corridor is being proposed supposedly for communication, not for people to communicate with each other, but for but for large uh, industries and commerce. There's the isthmus and uh, you'd like the, sec the next panel. So they're in the isthmus. An investigator came earlier and had identified that in Mexico there are more hundred more than four hundred and thirty conflicts. A lot of these are energetic conflicts, different types and throughout the different regions is detailed in the map. There's another conflict in Tamaulipas. It's not. And these are territorial disputes uh, for all the for all the resources that our uh, tribal nations have within their territories. Next panel, please. In this panel, we see the situation with the, uh, the isthmus. This is a zone that's very important for the migration of birds. It's a very strategic area that connects the Atlantic and the Pacific. Ocean. 
That's what was shown in the previous panel. A lot of the resources uh, are, are, are things that go to different places, like, such as Hawaii. regard things from the Pacific Ocean and in the, in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. The Isthmus is a, a corridor for, for merchandise, for production. It crosses through all the migratory uh, patterns that exist in the region. As Mario said, it's a place where indigenous cultures have been here for more than 3,000 years before Christ. It's a land that's occupied and a place that uh, the uh, Mexican government plans to occupy for, these, for the sake of these mega projects. They wanted to do it as if it was as if the isthmus was free land. They they could do whatever they they choose to. Just ignoring the indigenous cultures that have lived there for, for thousands of years. This is this is where the Ampong pueblos exist. These Zapotec, the pueblos uh, Mijes. Geographically, this region is comprised of indigenous tribes, and we are part of what this geographic region has formed. The following, we can see how in Mexico, in in 1994, a mega project was initiated. And in my region as well, there are strong wind currents, almost 200 kilometers per hour, that trailers would have to stop in order to, to cross through the region because it would flip over trailers, 18 wheelers. These are new paradigms that they speak to, to harness. And it's a problem within global capitalism that these are occupying these space. They want to plant, they want to plant industries, they want to plant uh, energy plants. And this is a Mesoamerican project where for example, the United States has installed itself along Panama to cross to Colombia to install more projects. In this global context, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, with the, with the uh, fact that these currents flow through in 1994, they wanted to install um, a wind wind farm. So the government issued a temporary order when they opened the store and the and the industries came. And they started they started um, uh, doling out the land, auctioning it. And so it's under the guise of this being a, a project to distribute energy. We already have 28 parts, uh, farm, windmill farms. So these industries came and said that they were going to first utilize the wind as a renewable energy source. 
this was renewable energy and it was going to support the rest of the world and and reduce global warming green energy not harmful and that people from this region would have more development access to more resources but this is a, a project that involves deforestation and the destruction of elements in life just as mario was discussing with water we've seen a reduction in animal life destruction and the resources that are accessible to the tribes and pueblos and there are more than 28 such parks in this region so the largest corporation shown here on the screen um the the next one just this is the region of Tehuantepec. here we are these are the major um corporations that have been planted there so on this screen we can see which of these corporations pertain to this undertaking These are on a global scale, they control renewable energy. They also control fossil fuels uh, and sources that contaminate. This uh, idea of renewable sources, they've just been seeking to undo some of the harm that they've done to the world. How is it possible that they speak of renewable energy and green energy when they're the same industries that have harmed the same companies which have harmed the environment and are sponging off of the territories to continue to produce their own abundance because they've sought to harness the wind that occurs in our region and that, that that's our our region because they they harness that wind to turn their to turn their windmills and as they're doing that they've stripped away our rights to our land and they've tried to make many changes so these are the companies that are benefiting from these wind farms. For example, there's Coca-Cola as well, Walmart, Simons, and then many multinational corporations that benefit from these. And these are the ones that are consuming the green energy that was that was promised to us. So their goal is really to put stores and put uh, industry and to industrialize, to contaminate the soil, kill animals, uh, killing ecosystems, causing the pueblos to create conflict between the pueblos and destroying our ways of life. They strip us of so many things. So the impact which I'm speaking of, what these mega projects has brought to us has been loss of loss of income, loss of loss of jobs, loss of our way of life, displacement, different social cultural changes. Nonetheless, we as a nation and as women continue to sustain life. And as long as there's life, there's hope to change things. And we're fighting to change these things. And this screen is to show that still with rocks and sticks, as women, we can protect these things. On the next 
on the next screen. Here we can we can we can see how uh, the development of these these uh, corporations, these green corporations. These are their um, gold star projects, supposedly that make them wealthy, while they bring struggles and unemployment to these to these local tribes, pueblos. And the one that we are protesting currently is the project called Tren Maya, the railway, all the way from the peninsula of Yucatan uh, as a touristic type of train. But it's going to go through different places. And what they want to do is convert these places into centers that generate money and income. It exploits the natural resources. So this, the building of this is, is the definite destruction of jungle, appropriation of water, contamination, in a series of conflict that's occurring in these areas because of this project. It's called a train, but it's not really a train. It's a series of projects. So what I would like to discuss today is a little bit on the following screens. They were put together they were talking about a transoceanic railway. Which is a, a mega project running through the Isthmus. Send the, the following screen. Here we see illustrated where they want to uh, dissect the Isthmus. To exploit the to exploit the resources that run through it. So you see, in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, is kind of a corridor. And then, well, Trump is leaving, but it was one of his dreams to stop the immigration of these impoverished nations in South America towards the United States. So with this project that's proposed, what they want to do is build a wall in Tehuantepec. And that they're also planning to install is a place to detain uh, immigration from South America, but also for them to be able to transport the the energy and the resources, which would, it, would, it would facilitate that for them. And so what this, this so what the goal is, it, it's a capitalist goal to facilitate the transfer of these resources and this merchandise. And it, even that which anything that can be seen wants to be, they want to make it merchandise. There will be a second phase of another 20 wind farms. They want to plan uh, fracking um, pipeline, a pipeline coming extending from Texas that would cross through the heart of the country, which would contaminate with fracking all the way down to Veracruz. With a, another line that wants 
helicopter and down to the Pacific. Uh, a pipeline for natural gas. And there, they're from the Pacific Ocean. It would run all the way to China, to Guatemala, and to further south. So this whole line of, of natural gas pipelines that once they want to run from Texas all the way down, they want to sell these, sell this gas to all the all the companies that are installed along this business. They want to build a refinery called Dos Bocas. And there is where the uh, the train would unite. Permiso, Bettina. Uh, uh, permiso. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, uno uh, uh, minuto más, uh, por favor. Termino. Pero, pero hay, hay, hay oportunidad a hablar más luego. Está bien. Entonces, miren, pues es finalmente eso. Well, ultimately, what it is is through these, through these mega projects that want to exploit what we have and cause conflicts and cause unemployment. These things never come up. They want to kill nature in order to ex extort those natural resources. And the fights that we're having between these indigenous nations, we're fighting for life. It's not just a fight against mega projects. But if we don't fight against these mega projects, they will end life. We don't have any other options except to fight. We don't have any other options but to defend what was what was left to us. To preserve our culture, our, our nation, our water, and our language. We're defending life, not just our lives, but the life of all of those who inhabit this planet. Thank you for hearing me. Muchísimas gracias, Bettina. Um, I just found it so profoundly uh, um, tragic how the, the, the wind farm, the energy for the wind farm doesn't go to communities, but to the advancement of the mega project. Uh, and what you were saying about the, the train isn't a train it's a justification for more projects. Um, and with that, um, I want to turn to uh, to John if you're if you're ready now. Okay, great. So I just want to begin by by um, sending my gratitude to Mario and to um, Bettina for these really amazing presentations and the the kinds of, not just ideas, but the way that their words kako us, they support us, um, the things that we believe as Kanaka Maoli and uh, the, the struggle that we're in. Uh, so I'm going to post something here. I, I should have sent this earlier so it could be um, put into Spanish as well, but uh, Jamaica is going to share this. Uh, these were the some of the issues as I was thinking about what I wanted to say that I thought were important, that, that seem to me are important issues for all of us who are uh, Native people. Um, and it starts with these sort of four issues or challenges, um, things that have happened to us historically, climate change uh, as a natural consequences of imbalances caused, caused by the rise of capitalist states in the past five centuries. Um, and we, you know, we're speaking of Spain and Portugal and uh, Britain, France, Germany, the United States, China, Japan uh, are, are capitalist states and, and they prolong um, 
the kinds of things that affect us. Second is the extermination of cultures. Um, these capital estates did not, they did not mature, they did not become wealthy uh, by some kind of accident. They became wealthy by enslaving other people and by taking the resources of others, by moving people around, by having just these enormous um, uh, abilities uh, to intrude on the lives of native peoples. And I'm gonna be talking for a minute about the Pacific Ocean as, as the site of that, which of course includes Mexico where you know much of this was generated by folks like Cortez and Pizarro and others and Magellan. Um, and we'll be talking about the larger Pacific. Um, so the extermination of cultures, um, the, the eradication of biodiversity, Third, the education and socialization, the way in which as a result of their takeover, uh, the education that they have put out to the rest of the world, to themselves as metropolitan countries and to the peoples that they have conquered is this socialization that normalizes consumption and massive accumulation so that we think that the normal way to, to live and to think about life is to get as much as you can to accumulate as much as you can and to guard that consumption from other people. Um, and fourth, the culture of scarcity that suppresses, actually suppresses risk-taking. We know that native people living on their own lands, we have lived in the most marginal places that one can imagine. Not Hawaii, of course. Uh, <laughs> we're very lucky here. But people live everywhere. They live in, just, in, in places that other people think of as deserts, as, um, and, and, I, and, and they find their innovation is in, in creating you know, abundance in those places and enabling them to live, to live well. Um, the kind of cultures that capitalist countries portray is that there's really only one way to live. And if you don't have those things, um, it's, it's something you should fear. Um, our people, and, and to me, the struggle that we are in, and I think it, it is a struggle that really, um, that all of us are in, uh, whether we are Yaqui or whether we come from the corridor, you know, wherever we come from, is that ultimately we must protect the places that sustain us. Um, those of us who live in this, in this century, our whole business, our whole life, what constitutes us as an element, as Mario would say, of, 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 of the land is that we must protect these places that sustain us physically, they sustain us physically, they sustain us emotionally, and they sustain us spiritually. Uh, more on that in a minute. Um, we must insist on our unique identities. Yes, we are all indigenous people, but we, we are different. We speak different languages and we have, we have been welcomed by the land and we've accommodated ourselves to the land in different ways. Um, but we are tied together in this struggle. Um, we need to educate ourselves differently than we have been taught to educate ourselves. So we need an education that normalizes um, ancestral languages our ancestors' language, their knowledge and their practices, because they learned um, how to live in this land and they learned how to pass on that knowledge to, um, to their descendants. And, and finally, and I think for me, what has been um, the hardest lesson to learn is that um, we really need to um, re-embrace the culture that treats all life as entwined and, and transcendent. Human beings are not, um, we are not the, the, this glorious species uh, that gets to destroy and trammel everything in our sight in order to feel comfortable and in order to uh, quote unquote progress. We are part of this land. We are part of the things that surround us. So um, I don't, I know how um, important it is to be brief here. I want to say that in the Pacific, so in Hawaii, the issues for us today are that 
after experiencing the colonization by the United States in particular, and um, living as we do in this 21st century, we find as, as Native people that um, we have no choice but to protect those places that are still accessible to us to live on, um, to worship in, um, to play and recreate in. I mean, that these things continue to be important to us. And that's why we protect places, not only that, you know, where we grow food, we, we, we have so many of the same kinds of issues as Mario and, 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 and Bettina, um, water rights and water issues, water diversions um, on this island, on Maui, uh, that have, have gone to produce sugar and, and to increase capital that basically denied our own indigenous farmers the water that they needed to grow taro and other kinds of crops. Um, all of these things are part of that colonial experience. And we fight today to restore the water. We fight today even to prevent the building of windmills that, you know, that impinge on communities like Kahuku. And we do this, right? Because ultimately those, the decisions to place those there are not made by those communities. They are made by others and regardless of the kinds of, of justifications they use, that this will be um, inexpensive power. This will be clean energy. This will spare us from having to burn, you know, millions of barrels of oil. Um, we are not convinced that that they are at all concerned about our communities and our lives on the ground. So what is clear to all of us is that we are all engaged in a common struggle together, right? And, and the struggle is against capitalism. The struggle is against governments that depend on that capital exchange for its existence. And we continue, we, we must, we must hold hands with all under, in other indigenous peoples um, to bring that kind of rule and reign to an end. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the Pacific, and I want to finish with a song. Um, Jamaica might sing this with me, but you never can tell. Um, if you'll... Um, Do you want me to share this? Yes, so they can see it. That. Okay. We're going to share this song uh, that I wrote at a conference. Jamaica and I both went to this conference of artists, poets, and musicians um, in... Um, Papua New Guinea, back in 2014, I believe that was the year. Um, Madang is this like tourist destination that was sort of built um, uh, to bring tourist money into the country. And we, we came in and we held this conference that was looking at native issues and environmental issues and at the way that artists can speak for our communities when our governments don't, right? Papua New Guinea is an independent government. Hawaii is still a colony of the United States. And we have so much in common, right? Um, our government still don't speak for us. This is the song that I, that I left, um, that, that I composed as part of my contribution to this conference. And it's called One Soul Water. In, in New Guinea, in Papua New Guinea, um, that word one salt water that means it's actually one salt water, one salt water, and it refers to the ocean, to the Pacific Ocean, and especially in the Western Pacific, we have all of these countries with, you know, thousands of languages, thousands of languages, and they are nested in the Pacific. The thing that that keeps them, that 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 tells them that they are tied together is this ocean. Um, that borders their islands, the, the places that they use for transit, the places where they reunite with, with cousins and ancestors. So um, I'm hoping that in this song, uh, I can convey to all of you the common struggle that we, we have. Um, we have been told to forget our past. We have been denied the use of our language. We have been taken from the places where we, that we knew 
where we could work and build and, and fish and plant. And we've been turned into other kinds of beings. And we have been told, this is what is natural. What you did before does not matter. And, and I believe, and this is how I will leave this, I believe that what we must all do is remember and reconnect um, with our ancestors in that way and with each other uh, across the world. And you're very welcome to sing along. It's a really easy song. It's a, it's a folk song. Once I had a memory that was long. Once I had a garden, now it's small. Once a water, I believe your soul. Once a water. Thank you, John and Jamaica. That was beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing the lyrics too. That was that was terrific. Um, oh, you guys are on mute now. He's just apologizing for not sending it to you. Not a problem. Um, excellent lyrics. That was beautiful. Yeah, uh, I want to turn to you, Ikaika. Okay. So uh, I don't need an introduction. Um, I don't. I don't deserve an introduction. That was John. John. John is my. Uh, John is my leader. So I adopt all of everything that John said. Uh, all of his remarks is my own. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm glad. Um, I'm so glad that he. And Jamaica sang and spoke today. Um, I, I can't really think of a better set of ambassadors for our country, for Hawaii. The only thing that I, I guess that there's a few little things that I can I can add. How much time do I have, Jason? A couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, if you want to take uh, like ten minutes or, or less, okay, if I'll, you want. I'll, I'll take three. Oh, okay, um, great. Because I, John and Jamaica did such a great job. Um, 
I just wanted to share a little bit about kind of where the, the work that I'm doing. Um, I live kind of between two worlds. I, um, I'm, a, I'm a union organizer. And so a lot of my work is on, on kind of old fashioned organizing, door, going door to door, talking to workers, talking to community folks and building power um, in that traditional, uh, I get a traditional it, with, it, with scare quotes, you know, that, that model of, of organizing. Um, and, but I'm also thinking a lot about what is the world that we, that we need to build. And specifically, I'm thinking about this decade, which I think we all feel and, um, and the United Nations, you know, they came out with a report two years ago saying that we had 12 years to make a massive global transition in the way that we all live. Um, and that's about carbon dioxide and climate change and all these things. And, you know, I've been thinking, I, I think about it in terms of my own children who are 14 and 11 and six years old. And, you know, that uh, in just a very short amount of time, um, the decisions that we as adults make is going to set into place, set into stone, the, the world that the kids and our grandchildren are gonna be living in for generations to come. And, and uh, however, you know, climate change is not an excuse to continue eroding sovereignty and our, our land, our resources. Um, you know, the, when I'm listening to Bettina and Mario and John in Jamaica uh, today, I'm reflecting about how uh, our lands have always been the, the kind of the, the fodder for these mega projects. The renewable energy economy is just the latest example of that. But in our own community here in Hawaii, we have, um, we have you know, John alluded to this earlier. There's on the island of Maui, there is an entire community of rich agricultural lands whose water has essentially been stolen for a century more in order to, in order to uh, enrich uh, a, a global corporation, you know, which is now a real estate investment trust, a REIT. Um, and they, they have stolen the water, they pocketed the profits, and, and this incredible agricultural community has been has been impoverished because of, of, uh, of, of that greed. On the island of Oahu, we have Pearl Harbor, what most people call Pearl Harbor, which we know as Kiaolao Pu'uloa. And it is a, an incredible area at the, at the um, kind of the nexus of all of these land districts that have fed our community for generations through the rich fishing and, um, and aquacultural resources of that area, which the United States took to become uh, an incredible military base. Uh, and I believe, I believe it's uh, Pula and also uh, Guantanamo were the first and second overseas United States military bases. So we have this, this tragedy, ongoing tragedy of, of native lands being stripped of their economic production, their ability to actually produce food and benefit for our community and being turned into vehicles for other, other uses. You know, whether that's the United States military, which uses our lands to practice and train and develop um, the ability to inflict damage on peoples all around the world, or whether it's, you know, something like, uh, like the, the system of water theft in East Maui. And so, you know, I, the question that, that I've been wrestling with is what is the economy that we need to build that is completely different? One that is um, where capital is not above the people, but really where we start to flip it and we develop an economy where the people, where the interests of our communities, of workers, where that is above capital and money and, and on all of those, those things. Um, so I've I wanted to share just real quickly um, three projects that I found really inspiring. Actually, maybe four. One is in in um, in the Basque region of Spain, 
there is a system of cooperatives called the, the, the Mondragon cooperatives. Um, I might be mispronouncing it. And so my apologies if, if I am, but it's an incredible system where there's um, something like 180,000 workers and they control the economic production of their community. It's really quite amazing. Uh, a few years ago in 2016, there was an event here in Hawaii where um, something like 2000 people came from throughout the island to rebuild an 800 year old fish pond in the district of Heia on Oahu, um, near where I grew up in Ko'olaupoko. And, and it was amazing because first of all, it's an engineering marvel that our ancestors eight centuries ago constructed this incredible piece of engineering that was able to feed the community um, and, and that it's still intact and that we gathered together to go and improve it today, you know, in, in our modern time. And that's the kind of work that I think that when we consider the economic transition that we need to make as a global society going forward, um, th that's, that's the kind of thing that we need to be working on. Uh, and part of it is, is that we have, to, we have to have new ideas. And some of those new ideas are gonna be really old ideas. The ways in which, you know, Bettina's community has fed itself for centuries, that Mario's community has fed, its, fed itself for centuries. Those are the ideas that we really need now. And, you know, while this, uh, while so much of our community is in, in a time of, of change. Um, the other two projects are energy related projects, but they're energy projects where it's not a foreign company coming in and telling us what we're going to do with our land and our resources, but it's the community uh, coming together on the island of Molokai and also here on Oahu around um, essentially a cooperative where it's community leaders coming together and they're saying we want energy and it's going to benefit us first and it's not going to be given, it's not going to be owned by a foreign company, it's going to be owned by the community of Molokai uh, for Molokai's benefit. And that's, that's to me incredible. And the last one is a, a, a project to create carbon neutral jet fuels because we in Hawaii are so dependent on aviation to get around that you know, it's, uh, it's an incredible um, liability for us, you know, this, this dependence on, on jet fuel. Um, and so it's a resource that we should be owning and controlling ourselves. And so there's another cooperative effort, effort to, to create our own facility here that benefits us, creates jobs, but is not controlled by, it's not controlled by foreign corporations. It's driven and, and run by our people here in Hawaii. So I, I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to listen and learn uh, from Bettina and Mario and John and Jamaica. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ikaika. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is, um, I am just stunned by the connections and the, um, uh, the tremendous insight that we have uh, represented in these frontline reports. Um, and you know, as Bettina was talking about the um, Trump's exit, uh, that that things will not change with with a Biden administration. Uh, that these are the the struggles that will continue, and um, it's these these mega projects are the 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 um, the connections between power and economy, and uh, and when we put uh, people and indigenous rights at the center of that conversation, uh, then we, you know, I, I think I really loved what you said, Ikaika, about the, the new ideas are the old ideas. Um, and um, I think that, that that makes complete sense to me. So thank you, everyone. Um, and in order to make a new sense of uh, these, you know, we, we want to turn to performance now. And, um, and so we're going to have uh, uh, Ben and Giselle go first. And um, and are are you are you guys ready to to launch now? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for, for inviting us to participate. It's such an honor for us to be here listening to uh, your stories and your, uh, your life and experiences in the struggle. Um, I, uh, my name is Giselle Sanat Rodriguez, and this is Ben Barson. Uh, we are both musicians. I, um, I am from Mexicali, Baja California, Mexico, and I am of Yaqui descent. Um, we are also part of the Afro Yaqui Music Collective. We are about nine musicians, um, but only uh, the two of us are here today with you. Uh, we uh, combine um, jazz and hip hop and um, funk uh, in, our, in our songs, but we also are very aware of, um, you know, of climate change of uh, two, 250 species go extinct every day. And we also understand the emergency of like in indigenous languages uh, on a verge to becoming extinct as well. So we try to incorporate indigenous languages from Mexico um, and uh, in our songs. And this, uh, this is our, um, an attempt. <laughs> um, it's a song in Nahuatl, um, it's an, uh, an Aztec language. And uh, it's, uh, it was written by Salvador Moreno. And uh, it's basically a song uh, for Mother Earth. You can see the lyrics that uh, we're gonna share with you right now. And uh, yes, I hope you like it. <laughs> The lyrics are in Nahuatl, English, and then Spanish in that order. And um, yeah, hope you like this also. Hope you enjoy it. Um, just let me get one second here. I don't know where my strap is. You need a strap? Um, Sorry, everyone. I thought uh, I was so prepared. <laughs> my, my nightmare. Oh, no. Where is your strap? Um, um, I have a backup strap. Maybe I can dance in the meantime. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> oh boy. You know, it's, it's unexpected things happen all the time. So thanks for being patient. It's um, Giselle, while we're waiting, would, would it be possible to, to share some of the, the lyrics in um Tell us more about this, the song itself. Yeah, yeah, the lyrics are in the right um, side. And um, one, one thing that folks have said about the blues is it's like an African-American commentary on, um, like when people talk about lost love, it's not always um, like uh, romantic love, but it's also the failures of capitalism, modernity, um, which is most pronounced in slavery and um, continued uh, racial capitalism. And I think um, the way we interpret this song, which is about um, the relationship between humanity and nature, and this is kind of overcoming the alienation that's um, happened because of, um, yeah, the cult of consumerism, as, you know, John and Al and everyone has spoken really eloquently about. Um, so I think that's uh, kind of, this is sort of a, a love letter to um, our disalienation, our process of disalienation. Can't talk, no, you're Thank <laughs> you. 
second everyone we are so excited to play for you here but we have uh encountered a
Yes, yes. Some, something like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Estamos wow. aprendiendo a manejar estos aparatos electrónicos, así que gracias por su paciencia. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that was terrific. I was just imagining that as the soundtrack of uh, to that that one line in in John's song about the armies leaving. That this is the soundtrack of the armies leaving. Um, yeah. So, uh, God, we are so fortunate to have all these, all of this talent, uh, all these wonderful voices. Um, and I, I, I want to turn to you now, Jamaica. Uh, if, if you're if you're ready to go now, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, can do. Um, wow. I don't know how I drew the short stick of going after all these amazing people. Um, I'm going to try to stick within my time frame. I'm going to share my screen because I decided while, um, while Mario and Bettina were speaking that it would be nice to maybe see some pictures um, as well as I tell some of these stories. Um, and I want to say a few things before I read these poems. The movement to protect Mauna Kea has been going on since at least the, 19, the late 1960s when the state of Hawaii offered the general lease of that mountain to the university that I work for, the University of Hawaii, um, who then went on and started basically handing out leases like candy to different corporations to build telescopes on our mountain without the consent of the native people. And of course, um, the backdrop of this story is everything that my father and Ikaika discussed, but it's also pretty similar to everything that Bettina and Mario discussed within their own context. Um, the movement to fight this particular telescope, the 30 meter telescope, also known as the TMT, um, began uh, at around 2010, 2012. I'm really bad at dates. I'm not a historian. I am a literature scholar. 20, 20, 2009, 2009, they applied for a lease. Uh, immediately, our communities said, no, thank you. We've said no already to all these other telescopes. The movement kind of blew up in 2014, 2015, when dozens of Kia'i, also known as protectors, were arrested on multiple stands, frontline engagements on the mountain to block the construction of this telescope. The movement has continued and exploded again in 2019 when we established a Pu'uhonua, a place of refuge at Pu'uhuluhulu, which is literally across the street from the Mauna, Mauna Awakea. Um, and so the poems that I'm gonna read for you folks today were written at that place of refuge, were written literally in the in-between moments of these frontline engagements. Um, and it's, but it's really important to recognize that, that these poems speak to a pretty short period within a very extended movement. And I can only really speak to this short period because um, honestly, I, I wasn't there in 2014 and 2015 when my people took the stand against the telescopes. I certainly wasn't there in the late 1960s. I was not alive. Um, but I want to share a bit of these, these stories. And, and I think it's important, especially in light of some of the things that, that Mario discussed about the way our love for our land, we call this aloha aina, um, that is both like an intimate love for our land, but also a, a love for our peoplehood and our nationhood, that that has been the story of how we've endured and survived all these violences, right? All these people have tried to remove us and we're still here because we love this land. Um, and they are explicitly trying to annihilate us and our way of loving, really, at the end of the day, it's our way of loving each other, our way of loving <coughs> this environment. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really moved by some of the things Bettina said about how these, these green companies are, are doing what capitalists and colonists always do, right? That nothing is safe from their extraction and nothing is safe from their desire to turn everything about us into resource that can be exploited. Um, and so the story, the poem <coughs> I'm gonna read, the short poem I'm gonna read for you folks today, um, offer an alternative when we're met with that challenge of having no other option but to struggle, as, as Bettina said, um, and that this offering of an alternative way to live is also providing for all of us uh, a different future. Um, 
So this first poem um, is called Frontline Pilina and the Malo of the Mauna. It means, um, Pilina means intimacy. It means uh, connectedness, what, what binds us together. And Malu is the word we use to describe being in the shade or protection of something. It's Wednesday and I find myself standing in the shadow of a Mauna that loves me like islands emerging from the sea, like a sky scattering herself in stars like a lahui kanaka growing. I'm standing in the malu of a movement, sorry, I'm standing in the malu of a movement that has captured a generation's heart and attention. I find myself here, my body, a kipuka expanding into Pele's pa hoi hoi grip, holding, holding, holding my quiet. It's Wednesday and I find myself without searching, arms linked in a line of women I barely know, but was destined to love. A line of women stretching back for thousands of generations, pole turned light, turned pukoa, turned slime, turned gods in the time of mere men. Who more fierce than these bodies of women? These moku turned aina, spilling out our sea of islands. It's Wednesday, and I am holding her arms like I am holding this mo'olalo, strong but tender enough to let both breathe deep. I am praying to be a wahine worthy of this moment, worthy of these hands holding me right back. And then Auntie tells me, we are the generation they always dreamed of. So it's Wednesday and now I am weeping. And every kupuna that ever fought, ever cried, ever died so that we would know for sure how to stand is singing right through me. And somehow, somehow I am still standing arms linked in a line of women holding me. And all I have to off offer them is this story that is incomplete. Um, this, um, you don't have to clap, it's okay. <laughs> they can hear you. Um, Wednesday is the day that they came in and they, they arrested our kupuna, our, our <clears throat> elders on this front line blocking construction vehicles. Um, after they were arrested, these women and hundreds more shortly followed behind us after, took over the road and were met um, by five different state enforcement, state and city enforcement agencies that attempted to remove us. During this time, I was going back and forth, mostly staying up on the mountain, well, at the base of this mountain, which is about 7,000 feet, um, and then going down into Hilo and Keokaha specific, specifically to spend time with my auntie and my uncle who would wash our laundry and feed us ice cream. Um, and in one of those times, I, this poem speaks about a, a moment I shared with my uncle while we were there. We sit across the table, mele about Mauna Kea play on the radio. And like always, we begin trading mo'olelo. Then we moved on to trading mahalo for standing for holding, for being, I am full. When he thanks me for our sacrifice, I tell uncle, it's such a beautiful time to be Hawaiian. And I watch a smile skim across his face. But then the winds change and uncle somber Makani gets caught in the back of his sail. Yes, I remember a time when it was hard to be Hawaiian, he says. And the whole ocean builds behind his eyes. And the stars he navigated across our largest oceans under come shimmering to the surface. And before the water can sweep him under, he turns away, takes the ocean with him out the door. And again, I remember again and again and again why this fight was so important. Um, okay. Should I read this poem or the other one? I think I only have time for one more poem. So is a preference? I think you have time for both poems. I have time for both? OK. All right, so so this poem is, is the only poem that I'll share with you folks today that wasn't actually written on the Mona. Um, this was 300 days after we first consecrated the place of refuge, the Pu'uhonua, um, and I was actually painfully aware of the fact that I was not there, that I was stuck on this island. And I'm not sure if it's because COVID had already happened or probably, 
yeah, we were living in the middle of COVID and so I couldn't leave. Um, and so I wrote this poem about, about that eha, that, that pain, that kalmaha, that weight of being away. Um, it's been 300 days since I first laid in your arms, first felt the chill of your kiss on my skin. You brought us to the thin line between life and death, between frostbite and heat exhaustion. You taught me balance, patience, compassion. And when you stretched your arms around us, you taught us safety, what it meant to create securities from our own bodies, voices. So for you, I am every child who imagined someday you would be free. I am every prayer laid at your feet these days. I am hundreds of miles away, but you still visit me in my dreams. We share ceremony with Neolopua, and in that realm, you keep all my secrets, all my fears, all I am too afraid or ashamed to say out loud for my fellow Kia'i. It has been 300 days since we marked the boundaries, lined our jurisdiction with the trembling tenor of our collective voice since we began to feed each other in food, in spirit, in care for you. I am everything that cannot be broken. I am your first pinky promise. I am the incoming swell. I am every bit of love you taught me to lay at your feet. I am songs between stories, between tears. I am the water we fought to protect that we shared together in the bitter cold of night when we worried no one else was coming. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll do this last one. And, and we um, originally we were gonna do this one first, but I think it's better to end with, with a bit of a song and a poem. You know, a lot of people, th there's so much you can learn about this movement by simply just going online and Googling Mauna Kea, the fight to uh, Ole TMT. Um, there's great videos, there's, there's great articles. Um, but there are only a small handful of people who can tell you the story of the first few nights we spent on that mountain together, just like there are only a handful of people who can tell you about what really happened in 2014 and 2015. And, I feel, I feel really blessed and lucky to have somehow ended up there in the beginning of this Pu'uhonua, of this place of refuge. Um, I wanna end with this mana'o, this idea that dad says what we need to do is reconnect to the teachings of our ancestors and reconnect therefore to our ancestors and reconnect to our land. Um, that is all true. I think it is equally important that we reconnect to each other um, and that in fact, reconnecting to land reminds us how to reconnect to each other in a meaningful way. There are so many people who don't understand why we would fight a telescope. It's the same people who don't understand why we would fight a wind turbine. Um, but there's something about this love for this land and this love for ourselves to self-determine that will not allow us to do anything other than struggle. And so I ask people who, um, and I don't think these, you guys are those people, but I ask people who don't understand that to, to listen to the poems we write and listen to the songs we compose out of aloha, out of love and recognition of these places that you might find resonance in that kind of profound love. And therefore you might understand. Uh, so we offer this folks to you folks as our, as our last uh, bit of performance. Uh, the song that dad will sing was written by Keola Beamer um, in the 1960s maybe 1970s, who knows, long time ago. Um, and the poem is my own. Ask me about the Mauna, and I will tell you about 30 Kanaka huddled, shivering in an empty parking lot, praying the Lahui would answer the call. I will tell you about two nights spent caught sleeping directly under a sky scattered in stars, in air so clear, Every inhale is medicine. How every morning I woke to a lahui growing as if we were washing Maui fish us one by one from the sea. Ask me about the Mauna and I will tell you how on the third morning I watched as 30 became a hundred, then a hundred became a thousand, then a thousand became us all, each and every one of our kakua standing beside us. Ask me about the Mauna and I will tell you the mo'olelo of eight kanaka chained to a cattle grate and the kokua who sat beside us, how we were never alone in the malu of our Mauna, how no one is ever alone in the malu of our Mauna. 
ask me, and I will recount their names. All 38 of Kupuna, one after the other, who showed us Mo'opuna how to stand, how I wept and wept and wept as I quietly held their names in my chest. Ask me, and I will sing the song of our Manawahine, all 100 of us, linked arms and unafraid, who stood in the face of a promise of sound cannons and mace, ask me, and I will tell you I have been transformed here, but I won't have the words to quite explain. I will say, I am not exactly sure who I will be when this ends. I am not exactly sure who we will be when this ends. But at the very least, I'll know that this Aina did all it could to feed me. That will be enough to keep me standing. My friends and I would sometimes go trails of mama care. Jamaica, thank you. Uh, that was so beautiful. Um, I, and we are at a point now where um, our time together is is coming to a close. Uh, but and I honestly don't know how to 
to say goodbye after all of this. Um, I am, am so struck by, by everyone's uh, stories and the performances. Um, and we had originally planned to have some time to ask each other questions, uh, but we, we've, we, we've taken up our, our time together. Um, but I, I, I want to, you know, as, uh, stay true to that, that intent, uh, and see if, if anyone has, has something that they, they want to share with, with, um, uh, with the others. I, I would just want to say, um, just like share my gratitude and I can speak for him too, because he's my father, our gratitude and in, in being involved in this conversation. One of the things that was really evident on the Mona and on the front lines was how, how much that this movement has only been made possible through building solidarity with other indigenous people and other people of color around the world. Uh, we got, we learned so much from Standing Rock, from Black Lives Matter, from, from every single indigenous person who came as their own, the representative of, them, of themselves, but also of their communities. And so um, I just wanna say how beautiful it is to be a part of continuing to build those pilina, those relationships with other folks who are struggling against the same violences that we are, who are, um, who seem so familiar, even in our differences. Um, and I just wanna mahalo you guys for, and hopefully someday soon we can be together in person um, and, and we can continue to build because we need each other. And I also feel very, I feel very hopeful about the future because we got we, um, and yeah, just very happy to be here, mahalo. I will need to add one thing, and that is that we're, we're really aware that this struggle, it's all one struggle, you know, even those people who are not indigenous people who are fighting for the environment, who are, who are fighting to change things, you know, so that we can meet climate change. Um, the socialists, the communists in the world, this is all the same struggle. And it's, it's a struggle for how people will live with dignity on their lands. Just adding myself to the stack, but want to let some other people talk. Oh, Ben, can you get closer to the mic? Just adding myself to the stack, but want to let some other voices speak first, but just before you transition to our goodbye. Um, Mario or uh, Bettina, would you like to speak? Bueno, yo, yo solamente quiero decir que que esta efectivamente es una lucha sola de todos y todas y, todas. y es una lucha por la vida porque lo que nosotros estamos luchando es por esa vida digna desde nuestras visiones desde nuestras vivencias desde nuestras diferencias pero eh, y porque estemos bien con la naturaleza como parte de esa naturaleza combate y explota, ¿no? Yo creo que es eso, y que cada quien cuando hace su lucha desde el espacio en que está, estamos construyendo una lucha común, una lucha por la elección y por la vida digna de todos y todas en el mundo. Y gracias por haber estado acá y por haberlo invitado y por estar juntos, porque estamos compartiendo una parte de esa Y la lucha es esta, la en el territorio, pero también es la lucha que hacen ustedes, que son los artistas, los músicos, antes, lo que escriben, lo que sentimos. Entonces, eso es parte de la lucha y ese también es nuestro alimento. Entonces, gracias por ser y gracias por Sí, claro, también para mí es muy importante esto que hemos compartido. Uh, para mí ha sido un aprendizaje constante. El, 
de escucharlos, el hablar. Disculpa, de... disculpa, Mario, disculpa a todos por la interrupción. Nicole, um, pienso que puedes cambiar tu canal porque ahora estás en el canal de español, so la traducción no está pasando por los hablantes de inglés. Did that work? Ah, yes. Okay. Cool. What's important to us in these types of events is to learn from each other. The same as my companion, has mentioned, our fight has traditionally been blow by blow. But nonetheless, we've learned from other tribes. But there are other tools with which we can fight, and that's art, the music. Poetry, painting, murals, things that have important messages, things that we had utilized, including all these technological tools that serve to unite the world. We started to use these things to exchange information or to eliminate disinformation, misinformation. So we also labor in these areas. And so this meeting is, is just a start. We can mature. We can grow better activities, project, provide continuity to this. And I'd like to thank Ben and Giselle, who had the idea to invite us. And all of those of you who are listening to us, hearing us and giving us this time to share with you. And I'd like to say that this, this, despite not being in the best health currently, like, we're, my Pueblo will be receptive to doing something like this in the future. The pandemic has hit us hard. We're fighting alone against this virus. And with what little we have, I had to do it for myself for now until there's a better time. Thank you, Mario. Ben, would, would you like to go next? Thank you. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you all for speaking the truth. And, and thank you all the people who stayed throughout the entire um, time. Uh, I also want to thank our translators because this was a very challenging, um, you know, it was so challenging to just uh, translate at the moment. And, and so we really appreciate your efforts to make this happen. Um, Jason, you are like incredible and, and we appreciate you so much and I just hope we can all like continue to be connected in and uh, thank you for everything. <laughs> you want to say something? Sure. This is our <laughs> this is our microphone to protect from the saxophone. It's like covered it up in all these cool sheets and things. Um, yeah, I think we live in a time of tremendous darkness um you know i guess i many of us know that fascism is at the root of the colonial project um with violent expressions all over the hemisphere um but it's a different thing to sort of see it you know in this kind of corporeal form that we're seeing it today in these crazy marches and in escalating violence um i just want to say um you know, this is the only way to fight fascism is to support decolonization, indigenous sovereignty, um, black and brown empowerment, because um, it's not, you know, we can't be tactical with our machinations within the sort of um, the representative system. It's founded on these genocidal roots, which we're seeing now are, you know, reaching new super high tech, scary forms and um, you know, unfortunately, I hate to say this, but I feel like things are only going to be worse in 10 years from now and 20 years from now. So this is the time of our lives when we can really make this commitment. 
um, especially speaking to other white allies here. Um, you know, this is something that you can devote your life to um, that should take place equal, equally or not more important to your career, um, to your personal relationships. Like you can make this the center of your life. And that's something I struggle to do every day. And some days are more successful than others. Um, so I just, that's, this is an invitation. Um, feel free to be in touch with us. Um, I'll put my email in the chat. Giselle Zanoth and I are also part of a, an international consortium of activists around indigeneity and um, ecological justice and uh, what we call eco-socialism. Uh, it's called the First Eco-Socialist International. We'll share that with you too. But there's just so many ways, as Jamaica said, you can do research, you can reach out to people. These are human beings with email addresses and uh, you know, like, you know, social and communicative intelligence. This isn't like an abstract thing. Um, the other thing I just want to say is I want to reiterate our immense gratitude to all of the panelists who, um, you know, we've known for some years and it's just so beautiful to have you all in the same place. This has been like a multi-year dream for us. Um, thank you for trusting us to, you know, make yourselves vulnerable, to make yourselves available for this. Um, we really hope that we can keep building together in concrete ways um, just to build the future and the present. And again, want to thank Jason for his vision and Glory Marie, Nicole, Kenny, and Courtney for your translation administrative support. Um, so thank you so much. We're so honored to be here with you and we look forward to more. That was perfect, Ben. Thank you. Uh, Ikaika, would, would you like to have the last word? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank in, in, you. know, incredible gratitude to everyone. Thank you all very much. And Ben, I just hope that a lot of hard work right now will actually make the next 10, 20, 30 years better. You know, if yeah. we kind of push really hard, we can set a better course for everybody. Absolutely. I'm sorry to sound pessimistic. No, I don't be. I mean, it, it, these are rough times. Pessimism is, uh, is well established and well founded. <laughs> An intelligent position. Yeah, we got to be real. What's going on? Um, I well, I, I I suppose an appropriate you know way to say goodbye is that we, we ought to do this again, and uh, and that we you know I I can commit to 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 making you know holding space at you know through the institute and the way that that we we. Are committed to this this dialogue and to creating uh, a, a different imagined community that uh, that connects you know across across land, across oceans, and and across struggles, and uh, and I, I look forward to that that work with y'all. Um, again, thank you everyone. Thank you to the translation team. Uh, we could not have done this without you. Thank you for being so brave and courageous uh, and jumping into this, this crazy project um, and dialogue. So um, but with that, I, 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 I have to say, be well, stay safe, and, uh, and, and take care of each other. <laughs>